good to see everybody here this morning. I pray you've had an awesome week. God's moved through your life. You've touched lives here in our community. Stand on your feet right now. Standing on the promises. Let's sing it, all right? Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises bring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. opportunity to be in your house this morning we are thankful father i pray for every smiling face that's here today every family that you just blessed dear god as only you can we're excited about today's service lord may the music be sweet may it touch hearts dear god may folks that are here today that don't know you may realize that this is the day that they need to give their life to you Father, I pray for Dr. Dave as he comes, dear Jesus, to bring us this message this morning that you've given him exactly what we need here today. Give us receptive hearts, dear God, and we will praise you for it's in your precious name I ask and amen. You may be seated at this time. This song says, get on your feet. We just did standing. Now we're going to get on our feet. So if you decide you want to stand up, help yourself. If you want to run around, help yourself. All right, let's go, guys.
letting go of every single dream. I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war. tells us, Lord, that you don't always give us those answers that we want. And you don't always work it out the way that we thought it ought to be. But that's what faith is about. It's about trusting you. Trusting your heart. Trusting your word. We can trust you for eternal salvation, but we struggle to trust you for day-to-day stuff. We're thankful with a God that's patient, loving, merciful, and gracious. I pray today that as we prepare to look into your word, I pray, God, that our hearts will be open and our spirit will be ready to receive what you have for us, and not just to hear it, but to respond to it, to say yes to your will and to your spirit in our life. We just pray that you'll bless Brother Dave, as he comes to preach to us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated, and our young folks are dismissed to 
Junior Church. We are glad today to have one of our missionaries and uh, Brother David Wood with David Wood Evangelistic Association. We're going to ask him now to come and bring God's word to us. Brother. If you get any more excited, brother, I want it to rub off on me a little bit. Well, it's just a joy to be with you today. It's kind of like when you come back a couple of times, you know people, and you get to renew your acquaintances with people and these kind of things. And so, Brother Mel, I am just delighted to meet you. And uh, he and I had an opportunity to fellowship a little bit. And it looks like you and I have been running the same path for a lot of years. It's just a blessing. It really is. Now, I want to thank you, first of all, for helping us through the mission support that you do for the International Division of Our Ministries, which is the Witness Project. When you came in today, you got a little brochure like this. Anybody did not get one, hold your hand up. The ushers will bring you one. If you did not get one of these, boy, they must have done a superb job. Look at there. It's wonderful. All right? This is not for you to read while I preach. You may be tempted to do so, but that's not the purpose of it. <laughs> but I do want you to read it. I do want you to look through it. It'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing and what your missions dollars were invested in. Uh, many of you have been praying for what we did in Kenya. We went over in January into Kenya and, uh, to open up for the first time the eastern side of Africa. You say, what in the world do you do? Well, we train national pastors in two things, soul winning and church planning, which is the book of Acts in operation. That's really what you find is the major thing in the book of Acts, soul winning and church planning. And we went over there and... Uh, we got a tremendous young man who's a student at University of Virginia who I met while I was preaching at Civic Auditorium downtown Richmond, Virginia about two years ago. And since then, he has translated all our material in Swahili. And uh, you say, well, preacher, why don't you do some of these other languages? As you'll learn pretty soon about the only language I know is Southern English, and I don't do a very good job of that. But uh, we have a great group of people who are in translation, these kind of things. Well, I went to Kenya, and I, we wanted to kind of set things up a little bit. And we wanted to know a little bit about, you know, can we set an office up there? Can we work in all the countries in the eastern side of Africa? And when we got there, we found out the leadership had already got us 97 people to train, 97 national pastors. So we kept for three days, trained them in soul winning. Over half of them had never won a soul to Christ personally. Now, don't let that shock you because over half the preachers in America have never won a soul to Christ personally. And uh, it's true of missionaries. It's true of Christians. And so we trained them, and the ABCs of how to lead people to Christ took them out in public and worked with them, and over, all but three won their first soul while we were there. So they learned how to win people to Christ, then we trained them in how to go back and run a program called Operation Go to train their people in soul winning. And then we teach them about church planning, this kind of thing. Three days later, we graduate them. They set two years' commitments. Now, those 90-some national pastors set commitments to go home and train 8,231 soul winners in two years. I want to tell you, that's a blessing. That means the average of what will happen is we'll have about 80 to 90,000 people won to Christ because of what happened. And uh, they set goals to plant 61 different churches. Well, I've never seen anything take off this fast. Already, we have reports come in regularly from what they've done through the headquarters set up there. Already, we had 11 churches planted in Kenya since January. That's a bunch. I don't know if it's ever taken off quite this fast. In addition to that, there have been a little bit over 1,800 that have been won to Christ personally, I mean outside of the church house, by soul winners that have been trained. One guy up in Nairobi came in and he was all discouraged and said God had called him to preach years ago, Brother Mel, but said I've never, I just have been discouraged, been discouraged, and God got a hold of his heart and, that came, and he came forward and told me, he said, I'm going to go back to Nairobi, which is a cosmopolitan town, capital of the area where you fly into. He said, I'm going to go back to Nairobi and start a church. He said, in two years, I'm going to run 2,000. You said, did you discourage him? Are you kidding? <laughs> I just poured gasoline on him. 
Isn't that right, Brother Tim? The guy gets encouraged, you just pump him up. And um, I'm telling you, he sends me a text, believe it or not. Only guy's ever done this internationally. He sends me a text every week. He has personally on the street won 81 people to Christ himself. And uh, it's just a blessing to see. He started his church. He's already broke 100. I just believe. I told him, he said, well, what if I don't hit 2,000? I made it up. I said, don't worry about it. I'd rather have 80% of 100 than 100% of nothing, so shoot for it. Amen? It's just a blessing to see what God's doing. Read that when you get home. I think you'll enjoy it. How many of you have a pen, a piece of paper? Anybody got a pen, a piece of paper? I want you to write three words down. If I had time <coughs> and we had enough sessions together, I'd be talking to you about what I believe we need today is a revival. And can I call it a revival of missions? Brother Mel and I were talking about it, talking about what we're doing and being able to come in and give a report on a couple of things. And I, I want to cement something, a couple of things this morning. And I want you to be here tonight. So we have hired a crew to come in and build a fence around here. Nobody gets to go home. And we're feeding everybody afterwards and keep everybody around. And I wish we could do that. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Yeah. So everybody come back and get cranked up again tonight. Amen? amen? All right. Now you can say amen when I preach. It won't scare me to death. It'll help me a little bit. And uh, I, I want you to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to deal with just very, very important subjects. Three words I want you to write down. You ready to write them down? I'm going to ask you for them later on. Number one, I want you to write down the word pray. P-R-A-Y, pray. P -R -A -Y, pray. You say, well, I thought you'd say a word about like that. Second, I want you to write the word down. Give. Pray. Second word I want you to write down is give. Third word I want you to write down is go. Now, it may seem strange for me to say this. The hardest of the three words is the word go. You say, well, that's because our job of going is to leave West Virginia, go get some training in Bible college and go to another country. Nope, that's not what the word go means in the Bible. The word go means it's a participle while you are going. That means you ought to be doing at home what you're paying your missionaries to do, you hope, overseas. Amen? Amen? Amen. People ask me on the mission field, a lot of places, in different places I go to preach around the world, they say, what's the biggest problem you have as an evangelist in America? I said, breaking up the mental paradigm that American Christians have on missions. <laughs> because missions to us, quite honest, in America is boring. I, you don't mind if I be honest to you. <laughs> I mean, you have a missions conference, hard to get anybody to want to come. Talk missions, everybody said, I've heard it all, and these kind of things. And we don't really equate it with what the Bible talks about a whole lot. I want to tell you, if you really understand the heart of God, and we're going to take a look at some of that today, if you really understand the heart of God, I think we'll find out that God teaches us the main thing is to get the gospel to another person. And he says we need to do that by going. <laughs> we do that in Jerusalem. We do that, by the way, this area. How many of you live within 15 miles of where we are seated this morning? How many live within 15 miles of this place? Well, that's your Jerusalem. So the first thing to do is go in Jerusalem. Then Judea, that's, I guess, West, West um, I want to say West Columbia, keep that, West Virginia. <laughs> that's West Virginia, which is the wild, wonderful West Virginia, right? And then the third thing is the United States. Does America need revival? Well, you know, if we're going to have revival in America, where is it going to start? Why don't it start in our Jerusalem? Amen? And why don't it start in this state? And God's given a great basis for the gospel there's no other state, I think, in this state. It's wonderful to see what God's doing across this state in so many areas. And then across America. How many of you have given up? Don't lift your hand. How many of you have given up on America? How many folks that believe God? Well, God, the best days of America behind. God can't bring revival to America. You know what God can do, folks? Anything He wants to do. We just need to pray. Don't you think so? Now, take your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 8. If you can do two things at once, hold your Bible up once you get it. Would you do that? Mark chapter 8. How many of you have your Bible? And once you get Mark chapter 8, kind of hold it up. If you've got an electronic Bible, you can hold that up. <laughs> and don't let it down. It's not very heavy. I like people to hold the Bible up for a preach, all right? So let's do it together. If you've got your Bible, you got it by now. Then I want you to hold your Bible up together, all right? Now, 
make the devil mad, shake it in his face a little bit. Amen? Amen. How many of you believe there's a real devil? Amen. How many of you believe the devil hates the Bible? Amen. How many of you believe that if we're going to have revival, we've got to get back to the Bible? Amen. How many of you believe we need the Bible back in our schools in America today? <laughs> Amen? So lift it one more time and tell the devil in your heart, say, I believe it. Amen? This is the Word of God. Mark chapter 8, let's look at a couple of verses together, can we? Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. The Bible says in Mark 8, 36, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole what? World, and then lose his own what? Soul. What is it going to profit a man if he can gain the whole world and then lose his own soul? Or the rhetorical question, verse 37, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's pray. Father, I pray that right now the Holy Spirit will cause a hush to come upon our hearts. Gather our attention to the Word of God, to you. Lord, I pray for that one who's here today who's never been saved. Should they die today, they would spend an eternity in a real hell separated from God forever. Oh, God, may somehow this morning not one person be able to leave here without saying yes to Jesus. Then, God, I pray you'd break my heart, break our hearts. God, I look at the task that you've given us to do, and God, I feel there are so many people that ought to be standing here, and God, except me. But God, you placed us here together at this time, and I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would honor your word, and God, speak to the heart of your people. And we'll thank you for that, for it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you again for the privilege of being here. And I want to remind you of something that I believe is true of every one of us this morning. I believe every one of us gets to the place sooner or later we look internally and we ask God a question. God, why am I here? What good does it do for me to be alive? Or, hey, what am I going to leave behind when I die? Maybe you could ask the question this way. If God were to take your life today, if this was the last day that you ever lived upon planet Earth, what could you look back on and say, I have lived successfully because I have accomplished that particular thing? Or asking the question different, what am I living for? Several years ago in Grand Rapids, Michigan, second city that we were able to plant a church in before I went into evangelism, um, I was coming up on something every one of us face every year. I was going to be 40 years old. Now, don't ask me how long ago that was, Tim. I'm not going to tell you. But I was coming up on 40 years old. And I began to think about it. In a few days, I'm going to be 40 years old. You ever think about that when you turned that a long time ago? When you turned, I mean, but all of us think about that, don't we? I'm going to be 40 years old. Now, age had never bothered me before then. It's never bothered me since. But I began to think about it. If I were to die when I'm 45, I only have five more years to live. And I knew people I went to high school that had already died. I thought about it. If I would live till I'm 50, I only have 10 years to live. How many of you would agree with me? <laughs> 10 years is not a very long time anymore. <laughs> we think about that, right? And I began to think about things like that, and I asked God a question. Because I began to think about homes, and thank God for homes, and thank God He provides us a great place to live. I begin to think about our worldly possessions and the few things we do have or we don't have. I begin to think about automobiles, and I begin to recognize a hundred years from today, that home won't be anymore. A hundred years from today, that automobile will be gone or on a scrap heap somewhere. A hundred years from today, all the things that I put my life in and that we have, they're not going to be around. So I begin to ask God, God, is there anything that I can invest my life in that I'll never lose? And I begin to search the Bible, I found there are two things. Now, you may find other things of significance that orbit around these, but I believe there are two things. Number one is the Word of God itself. Ladies and gentlemen, this Bible is not man's Word. It is God's Word. This is not a temporary book. This is an eternal book. This is not a book for us to lay aside or not. This is God's holy word. I thank God for people who get Ph.D. degrees and study 
and start different things, and they call it to protect the Word of God instead of the Word of God, and thank God for that. But I want to say something to you. If man never did one thing to defend the Word of God, God can take care of His Word by Himself. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word shall abide forever. You ever thought about this? Every time you give a nickel to publish your Bible, every time Sunday school teaches, you teach the Word of God. Listen, Christians, every time you give out the Word of God, any context you give it, everything you do, memorize the Word of God, read the Word of God, everything you do that orbits around this book, you will never lose it because this is an eternal book. Amen. Now, I wish I had time to preach on that this morning, but I do not. But I want to speak to the second of the two. Number one is the Word of God. It abides forever. What is the second thing? that abides forever. The second thing is the human soul. The human soul. Think about this. There was a time that you did not exist. You say, preacher, what do you mean? I mean, very simply, I don't know how to say it different. You just were not. There was no you. But at a certain moment in time, God moved upon your mother's womb and a miracle took place, and conception took place, and you became a living soul. God is the author of life. The sanctity of your life is one of the bedrock basic things of civilization if man is going to have law and order. To understand law, to understand life, to understand that God is the author of life. It is not human government that is the author of life. It is not a judge that determines when life starts. I want to tell you God is the author of life, and God is the one that brings life into being. God gave you life. Amen. There's a certain time that we were not, but God breathed upon your mother's womb, and you became a living soul. Amen. And since that time, you will never cease to exist. Everybody in this auditorium, everybody, all 8 billion people on planet Earth will live forever somewhere. If they're saved and they die, thank God we can know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're going to heaven when we die. There are three things about that important. Number one, it's very important for you to be saved. Number two, it's very important for you to know that you're saved. And number three, it's very important to know that you cannot lose your salvation once you are saved. Amen. Thank God once you're saved, your soul is going to spend an eternity in the presence of God in a place called heaven forever. Amen. But wait a minute, people who die without Christ, they're going to live forever also. But not in heaven, but in a place called hell, separated from God forever. This morning, if you'll allow me to do so, I'd like to take a few brief minutes to talk about the value of just one soul. Just one soul. I thank God that we're able to see sometimes 10 people saved, sometimes 100 people saved, sometimes three people saved. And thank God that you can see multiples of people being saved. I've shared people sometime with an event that happened to me in 1998 when I was in Manila. And um, the year before we started the International Division of the Ministry, that you're holding that paper on the Witness Project. And every night, seven nights in a row, over 100,000 people showed up preaching the Word of God to see literally thousands of people say yes to Jesus Christ. And thank God for that. Thank God for maybe 1,800 people that have been saved in Kenya since January. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about the value of 100 souls or a thousand souls. I'm talking about the value of just one soul. How valuable is one soul? Look behind me and what you'll see, right in front of the baptismal, you'll see something counting, counting. You know what that's registering? That's registering how fast people die while you're sitting in this auditorium in the world. You say, when did that start? 10 o'clock as Sunday school started. You see every hour, and I think sometimes we as God's people don't like to think about what really happens and what's really going on. But every hour, there are 7,200 people who die. Every hour. That means during this preaching hour this morning, we started, what, 10 minutes to 
11, and you, I know you're hoping you're out by 12, but somewhere in that ballpark. <laughs> but uh, we, we're in here, let's say, an hour. And during that hour, on planet Earth, 7,200 people die. I've done some research on it, and some people would like to say that 10% of the people who die go to heaven, that they've been saved. I would like to tell you that I believe that's true, but I do not. I think what they're talking about is people who register and say, I believe in God. Or they might say, I'm Christian by preference or something like that. It does not necessarily mean that they've been born again, but I wish that were the case. If that were the case, that would mean that 6,480 people, 90% of what you see behind me, were not in hell when Sunday school started, but they are in hell right now. And I'm not talking about the value of a 1,000 of those souls. I'm talking about how valuable is just one soul. Do something with me a moment. Would you do this? I want you just to breathe with me five times in and out, just regular breath. Would you do that? Help me. Let's do it together. You ready? During that time, seven people dropped into hell screaming. He said, Brother Wood, are you trying to be morbid? No, what I'm trying to do is get to the main thing. Because if I understand the Bible right, God left us with one primary task. Thank God for property that churches can have. Thank God for wonderful buildings. Thank God for technology. Thank God for his provision for us. Thank God we can have orphanages. Thank God we can have feeding centers. Thank God we can have missions. Thank God we can do this and do that and do the other. But the major job that God's left us to do, according to what Jesus said, is to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature on this earth so they'll have a chance to be saved and not go to hell when they die. Amen. How valuable is one soul? Write it down. First of all, I think you'd have to compare the value of that soul to the statement of the Scripture. The statement of the Scripture. Over and over in the Bible, the Bible talks about a lot of things that help us to understand how valuable one soul is. The statement of the Scripture. I read it to you in Mark chapter 8 a moment ago where Jesus said, what is it going to profit a man if he gained the whole world and then do what? Lose his own soul. You say, well, preacher, I guess that verse is teaching us that one soul is worth more than all the money in America. That's a true statement, but that's not what God said. God said one soul is not worth more than all the money in America. Why, God said one soul is worth more than the whole world. You say, well, I guess that has to do with all the money of all the monetary systems and currency on planet Earth. Well, that would be true also with the gold, the silver, the different currencies that have been printed. But that's not what they're talking about either. One soul is worth more than all the money and all the gold and all the silver that you could find and compile in a pile on planet Earth. One soul is worth more than the whole world. You say, preacher, I can't really understand how big that really is. Then turn to 1 John chapter 2 for just a minute. I want you to do this with me, 1 John chapter 2. And the Bible gives us some verses that most of us are familiar with, and maybe you familiarize yourself with these and even memorize them. 1 John chapter 2, first of all, verse 15. God says to me, because I'm a Christian, God says to you, because you're a Christian, 1 John 2, verse 15, help me with this, love not the, tell me aloud. There's your word world. Love not the world. Think about that, love not the world. Now, wait a minute, one soul is worth more than the whole world. And God said, now, wait a minute, don't fall in love with the world. Neither the things that are in thee, help me, what's that word? World, if any man love the what? The world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's stop there for just a minute. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. What God's telling me, he's saying, David, you got to make a choice. You're saved, you're going to heaven when you die. Now, you got to make a choice. Are you going to hold on hands with me, or are you going to hold hands and fall in love with the system on this earth called the world? Which one? And I want to tell you as an American citizen, you live in a generation and in a culture, and thank God for his goodness to us. I think it's by the grace of God that you and I were born in America, and I mean that with all of my heart. 
I want to tell you, it would be some kind of pride and arrogance for us to say that we were born American and somebody else was born in Malawi, Africa, the fourth poorest country on this earth. They only have enough money to eat one meal a day. Why, look at here, I'm an American. They what they are. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, let's get humble about this. If you are an American citizen, you ought to thank God for the grace of God. You ought to thank God you were born in this country. You ought to thank God for the freedom that you have and the opportunity. But with that comes great responsibility because this culture that we live in tugs at us like a magnet. And this culture is trying to tell me, love me and not God. Serve me and not God. Be in love with me and not God. God said, wait a minute. I got news for you. You got to choose. Look at the last part of that verse. He said, because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You can be saved and not love God with all your heart. I think one of the things we ought to do every day is refresh our love for God and our service for God. Not once a week, not once a year, but I want to tell you, every day it needs to be done. You say, well, that still doesn't teach me what the world is. The value of a soul compared to the world. Look at the next verse. 1 John 2, 16. This verse does. Look at the second word in verse 16. A little three-letter word. Somebody tell me aloud what it is. For what? All. Not some things, but all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's not of the Father, but that is of the world. I want to give you, take that pen and write down next to three, th a couple of words, would you? What is the lust of the flesh? Write down the two words. Would you write these down? The lust of the flesh is to do. The flesh desires to be fulfilled. The flesh desires to be satisfied, to do, to do, to do. The flesh, all of a sudden, you see something, you think of something, you hear something, and some of these things may be all right in and of themselves, but a lot the flesh lusts for is sin. And the flesh wants to do this, or he wants to do the other. I got a precious cousin who had a problem with drinking. And finally got to the point, he said, man, I have just drinking has compurled me. He has taken me over, taken my life over. And he's college trained in being a chef. And he was, had a good job at a big restaurant. But he had to be around liquor, had to be around a lot of sex sin. In order to work in that restaurant, he went to bagging groceries once he got right with God. To so get out of an environment that would drag him back down. You say, well, he ought to be able to handle it. Well, he couldn't handle it. And he decided, I'd rather bag groceries and love God than get that big income and serve sin. That's what this is talking about, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, to do. Write down the two words on the next one, the lust of the eyes. What is the lust of the eyes? To have. Boy, I like to have that. And I will tell you, it doesn't escape any of us. Have you men like motorcycles? Let's try that again, because I don't want you lying in church. How many of you men like motorcycles? Amen. I do too. I had one up years ago, and my wife told me one time, Brother Mel, she said, you know, I don't understand men. I said, well, that's normal. I don't understand women. So, you know, what do you do? You got to learn and have a good time. Amen. She said, well, I said, well, what do you mean, hon? June looked at me. She said, well, I don't know why in the world men like that sound that comes from a Harley motorcycle. What do you say? So I'm riding downtown Chattanooga one time. She's sitting over here, and I'm sitting here. It's dual lane. I'm coming in the left lane and sitting in the right lane at a stoplight. There's two Harley motorcycles. I pull up next to them, and she looks at me. I said, shh. I let the one down on her side. She said, what's it? Shh, don't say anything. Just listen. That light turned green. You know what it sounded like. Thunder. I mean, both of them cranked up, and I kept I mean, they thought I was racing them. I guess I kept side by side, so it was right by my window. She listened to that thing. She's going like this. I said, hold on a minute. Just listen. Hold on a minute. Listen. Pretty soon I let her wonder up. I said, honey, after you heard that, if you don't know what a man likes about that sound, not any words I say will help you at all. <laughs> Amen? What I'm trying to tell you is, you know, some things, what happens, we don't think about them. I kind of like muscle cars. Anybody like that? Sometimes I go by and see a big muscle car, and I want to say, well, I like that muscle car. I don't know what in the world I'd do with it. I'd have to spend a lot of money to get a garage. Who said drive it? You've got the best sense of anybody here. Amen, brother. I wouldn't have nowhere to drive it. Can't you see me driving up in front of this church in a big old muscle car, <laughs> making all that sound coming down? Maybe it'd be better. Maybe everybody knew I was genuine. I don't know what it would be. I'm trying to tell you, 
I know what you ladies are thinking, those men. Now, wait a minute. How about you turn it on television and look at Home Shopping Channel? No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not going very far with this. <laughs> I know what side of bread my, my butter's on. I tell you what, I'm just trying to say, how many of us understand what that lust of the eyes? That's all I'm trying to say. We know what that lust of the eyes. We haven't even thought about having that house. We haven't thought about that car. We haven't thought about that dress. We haven't thought about a, this vacation. We haven't thought about it until we saw it. And once we see it, the world's good at dressing it up. And we'd like to do what? The two words that they have. God said one-third of the world has to do with what you want to do. That's the lust of the flesh. One-third of the world is what you want to have. That's the lust of the eyes. Then the third has to do with the pride of life. The two words I want you to write down is to be, to be, to be. Because, you know, pride wants to be. If I could be this person, people would think more of me. My self-image would improve, whatever else. The reason this is the hardest of the three to really understand, God is not against you succeeding. God is not against you achieving great things. God is not against anything that has to do with people going out and accomplishing great things in their life. The difference is who gets the glory for what you accomplish. The Bible says God ought to get the glory for everything that's done. The difference in the world's approach and a believer's approach is very simple and easy to understand. The world says, I can do all things, and walks out and says, it's all about me. I can do all things. The Christian says, wait a minute, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And that's the difference in the two. But this, this one that has to do with the pride of life, to be, it means, man, if I was a cheerleader or maybe if I was a quarterback of the team or I was head of this in business, all of a sudden people would look up to me and who I am. God said, if you had all three of those, you'd have the whole world. And one soul is worth more than the whole world. Now, let's see if we can illustrate that a little bit. Let's bring somebody up here, maybe a really good guy, a businessman, and it's a good thing, and he's created business and, and, and for the community and income and jobs, and that's a good thing. But this guy's gone about it, and he says, you know what? I built a circle around myself. Anything that I've looked at I want to have, it's mine. And he pretty well was good. Now, wait a minute. You say, well, that'd be good for him to have. But I don't want to just have it today. Watch. I want him to have it. Past. Let's say we give this guy everything that his lust of the eyes have ever wanted to do in the past, in the present, and in the future. He'd have one-third of the world. Now, let's give him everything he's ever looked at that he's wanted to have through the lust of the eyes in the present, it's his. In the present, it's his. Wait a minute. In the future, everything he'll ever look at is his. We give him the second third of the world. And then everything he's ever wanted to be. I mean, he's accomplished it all. He's voted the most this, the most that, the most that. In other words, this guy, past, present, and future, has got everything in the lust of the flesh, everything in the lust of the eyes, and everything in the pride of life. And by the way, nobody will ever have that. Satan will promise it to you, but Satan is a liar, and he cannot fulfill his promise. Amen. But if this man had it all, then let's bring another guy over here. And maybe he never went to a fancy college, which neither here nor there. Well, this guy over here got saved and he loves the Lord. And he decides that he's going to go out and do what he can to try to win people to Christ. He starts out in a trailer park and goes down and knocks on the door to a trailer park and meets a little snotty-nosed nine-year-old boy that's got a harlot for a mother and a drunkard for a dad. The boy isn't fed right. Nobody cares about him. He's dirty. Doesn't have anything but clothes on and need to be washed. And that guy gets on his knees and communicates to that little nine-year-old boy that society's forgotten about it. Can't give a dollar to the church. Can't help in any way. And that guy decides he wants to bring him to Sunday school. Picks that little boy up, takes him by McDonald's and buys his breakfast and buys him a meal and brings him to the church. Somebody at church loves him enough to give him the gospel. A couple weeks go by and that little boy receives Jesus Christ as his Savior and becomes a born again child of God. Can I tell you, in God's economy, this guy over here has done it all, and that guy's done nothing but waste his life. Amen. I want to tell you, the soul of that one little snotty nosed nine year old boy is worth more than the whole world. Amen. You want to know how valuable a soul is? 
I'm talking about people in your family. I'm talking about your brother, your mother, your dad. I'm talking about your neighbor, the people you work with. That person you want to witness to, but you've never witnessed to that person. That person you want to invite to church, but you put it off. That neighbor that you ought to have knocked on the door to say, listen, I'm a believer. Let me know if I can pray with anything for you. Anything you can do to try to get that person moved towards God. I'm talking about the value of the soul of that person. You want to know how valuable it is? You need to compare it to the Scripture, the statement of the Scripture but you need to compare it also to the sacrifice of the Savior. The sacrifice of the Savior. You know, I wish somehow I had the ability. It would take hour upon hour to do so. And I don't think anybody would move if I had the ability to be such an orator that I could describe the entire scene of the crucifixion. I want to tell you, if you want to see an example of the love of God, go back and reread and study the Gospels about the sacrifice Jesus made. He didn't have to. You're talking about the grace of God. Jesus didn't have to come, but he did. Jesus didn't have to go through what he went through, but he did. And when they took Jesus in the garden and he was betrayed and they hit him and drug him off to Annas, who took him off to the Roman leaders, eventually to Caiaphas and to others, and they condemned Jesus. And then, hoping to release him, they scourged him, sent him below. And when they scourged him, according to the Bible, and my study of what happened, I looked at the Scripture, and it says when they scourged Jesus, when they finished, there was nothing left anymore that looked like a man. Can you imagine tying somebody's feet to the floor? and tying his hands together and putting a rope around his hands and throwing it up over a pulley and pulling that rope down to where you stretch his body out tight and somebody taking what some of us have called a cat of nine tails and we take that thing to snap on his body, being so trained with that whip that they could cut layers into his skin and cut deep into the muscle and go around and cut the sinew loose to where the bones will not cooperate with what the brains want that part of the body to move. Can you imagine a body being cut to shreds where it looks like some animal that's been skinned alive and hung up that cannot even be recognized as a man? That's what Jesus looked like when they scourged him. But it had just gotten started. It had just gotten started. They pulled him out before the crowd and they stood him on a pedestal. They stripped him nude to embarrass him. Can you imagine the humiliation of what Jesus did in order that our sins could be forgiven when he made that sacrifice. Listen, and it still had not finished. They pushed him up to the top of Mount Calvary. The Bible says that some hated him so much that they reached out with their teeth and bit him as he walked by. They took sticks and beat on him. One reached out according to the prophet and took the face or hair he had and tore his beard loose as he walked by. They got him to the top of Mount Calvary and laid him flat on the ground. The cross piece had not been nailed together yet. They took one nail and crossed his ankles and drove that nail down. Then they took his body and pulled it tight on the ground and put the cross member down. And they would wedge one elbow, then wedge the other elbow until they could get that hand back and drive a nail. Drive the nail just so he could hold the body, would not tear loose. Then they set the cross upright and they let it drop in a socket. Here's Jesus, the Son of God, his body whipped to the place that no longer looked like a man, humiliated, naked, hanging on a cross with people jeering at him and cursing at him. But I want to tell you, when that blood went down across the body of Jesus and that blood dripped off the bottom of his feet and dropped into the dirt of the ground, I want to tell you it's the most holy thing than any dust or any place or any root or any grass seen it ever had because that is the blood of the very Son of God. That's the blood of the righteous Son of God, of the sinless Son of God, who came to this earth for one purpose, so you don't have to go to hell when you die. And that's the only thing that will pay the penalty of sin. That's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I got news for you. If you were the only person that ever lived upon planet earth, Jesus would have died just like that so you could be saved. So if you want to know how valuable that soul is, you and I ought to be reaching you got to compare it to the sacrifice Jesus made. The sacrifice. 
How many of you have ever been in a service where I brought a message I sometimes call the dramatization of the crucifixion? Anybody here ever been in a service when I did that? Maybe five or six people. Last time I brought that message was overseas, Mexico City, on a Thursday night last summer. Church has a, down our seat, seven and a half thousand people. We had over 8,000 people that night. And I want to tell you, when that building went dark and I began to describe the crucifixion and I turned around, I could hardly preach because I began to think about a 19-year-old boy in Lynchburg, Virginia that cursed God, that claimed to be an atheist when he went to Virginia Tech so people would leave me alone. I didn't want nobody witnessing to me. And I began to think about how God loved me enough to to put up with all of my cursing, to put up with all of my sin and all my rebellion. You say, you thought about that? I don't ever want to forget what God's done for me because I want to tell you, in the bottom line, you and me are exactly the same thing. You know what we are, brother? We're sinners saved by grace. There's nothing righteous about us. It's nothing any better about us than anyone else. It's by the grace of God that we're saved. It's by the grace of God. I looked around at that cross and that spotlight on the cross in Mexico City last summer. And I stopped and I waited a minute and started preaching again. I gave the invitation that night. And 1,018 people came forward and said yes to Jesus Christ. That church baptizes just as soon as people are saved. They have a baptismal pool that's a little bit wider than the front of this auditorium. They have six people that baptize at one time. 516 people were baptized that same night that had said yes to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because somehow God took the sacrifice that Jesus made. He took the gospel and convicted people, and they said, Jesus loved me that much. I'm going to say yes to him. Look at me for just a minute. If you're in this building and you're in a Sunday morning service in this church, I'm, very, I'm excited that you're here. But if you've never been saved, Forget everything else and remember this. God brought you here so you'd have an opportunity to say one word to God. You know what that one word is? Yes. God wants you to say yes. Don't play with it because your soul's too valuable. Let me quickly give you one other thing. You want to know how valuable a soul is? You must compare it to the statement of the Scripture. I don't think you can know without really looking through the statements of the Scripture on how valuable one soul is. And then the sacrifice of the Son of God. But you must also compare it to the suffering of a soul that dies without Christ. The suffering of a soul. For ladies and gentlemen, there really is a hell. There really is a hell. I think we have forgotten how long hell is going to last. How many of you are saved this morning? How many folks are saved? You know Christ is your Savior. Can somebody tell me aloud, how long you will be in heaven? Forever? How long is forever? <laughs> You'd have to go to the Bible and you get some verbs and adverbs and some, some prepositions that describe the endurance of forever. But can we just say, I, I, no way to describe forever. How can a finite being understand eternal life? We're going to forever be with God. And thank God, we're going to forever be with God and forever glorify God, forever be in heaven. And I want to tell you, when you got saved, you didn't get 100-year life. You didn't get 1,000-year life. You didn't get a down payment. You didn't get partial payment. When you got saved, you got eternal life. You got all of it. And you're going to be in heaven forever. But wait a minute. If your friend or loved ones dies, they're going to be in hell just as long as you're going to be in heaven. Because hell is forever and forever and forever. There's fire in heaven, separation of God, there's anguish, there's cursing. We don't have time to talk about that. You need to study much in the Bible yourself and give yourself an assignment to understand a little bit more about the awfulness of hell. A man on a plane who was lost coming out of Seattle years ago I gave him my Bible and asked him if he'd just read the Gospel of Matthew. And underline for me in the Gospel of Matthew, every time Jesus said anything about sin, death, and hell, and punishment, the man said, I'm not a religious man. I've never read the Bible. Maybe it'd be good for me to take a Bible exercise. I said, we'll do this. It won't take you but 40 minutes. We got about a four and a half hour flight. He sat down next to me and he took my Bible 
And I said, everything Jesus said is in red. Just underline everything you said about sin, death, punishment, and hell. And it wasn't but about 30 minutes went by, and he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, I can't believe it. He said, people have told me there was no hell. People have told me there's no fire in hell. I said, what did you learn? He said, I learned that Jesus said there is a hell, and that hell is forever. I've learned that Jesus said there's fire in hell. I've learned that Jesus is a little bit of an extremist. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, if I have a hand that keeps me from being saved, I'd be better to cut my hand off and go through life with only one hand and die and go to heaven than have two good hands and die and go to hell. He said, I'd be better to pluck my eye out if this eye kept me from being saved so I could go to heaven when I die than die with two good eyes. That man, before we hit Atlanta, trusted Christ as his Savior, and I thank God for that. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, if you want to know the valuable, how valuable your loved one or friend is and that soul of that person, you need to compare it to hell. And the suffering, they're going to suffer forever and forever and forever separated from God. In the northeast section of our country several years ago, there was a young man who was 18 years old. He rebelled against his parents, rebelled against his dad and all authority, was living a wild life. He got drunk one night, was trying to drive home. Coming around a curve, he lost control, went over to an embankment and went into the a, a raging uh, body of water, a river. And that car began to sink. He could not get the door open. He couldn't get himself out. He thought he was going to die. And about that time, a strong arm pulled the door open. And another one reached in and wrapped around him and pulled him out. And he began to feel himself being tugged towards the shore. And his life was saved. He did a little research and found out that the man who saved his life was an Olympian trial swimmer. Five years later, he had learned nothing. He became so wicked, he became involved in an incident where he shot a man and committed murder. He went to trial. The jury went out after hearing the prosecution and the defense, came back in and pronounced that he was guilty of first-degree murder. The judge said, I'll sentence him tomorrow. The next day, that man walked in with his attorney and stood there. The court stood up. The judge looked at him and said, young man, you have been found guilty of first-degree murder, and he sentenced him to death. When he mentioned the word death, the young man shook, and he began to scream aloud, I don't understand. Your Honor, how could you do this? He said, what do you mean? You may not remember it, but five years ago, you dove in the water. You swam to a car, opened the door. You reached in, and you took me and pulled me out, and you saved my life. I don't understand it, Your Honor. How could you have saved my life five years ago and sentenced me to death today? And the judge very quietly looked at him. He said, son, Five years ago, I was your Savior. This morning, I'm your judge. Can I tell you that every human being on this earth is either going to respond to him and accept him and say yes to him as a Savior. It's our job to get that message to him. Or one day soon, they're going to stand before him as a judge. Now, let me tell you the problem. The problem is, I don't know how to say this any different. Let me just talk to you from my heart. You don't think you count. You don't, I, I mean, I'm talking about me, I'm talking about you. We just don't think we count. Sometimes uh, the devil wants to get to the point, God can use the preacher. God can use somebody on television. Or God can use one of these preachers and the past has gone to heaven now. A God can use Brother Wood, maybe a God can use somebody else, but God can't use me. And therein is where we find that we do so little for Jesus Christ. See if I can illustrate for you and show you how important you really are. <clears throat> I met a young man right before the service and asked him if it would be all right if I asked him a question to him, and he said it would. So, Brandon, I'm going to ask you to help me if you would for just a minute. Would you stand for just a minute if you don't mind? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to say yes, if you would, just good and loud. You'll be, you won't mind saying yes to this one. Would you be willing to be a soul winner and influence people to go to heaven when they die? Yes. Wonderful. Then I want you to turn and point to just one person in this auditorium, anybody, quickly, just one person. Now, would you stand, the person he's pointing to, would you stand? Quickly, just stand right up. 
Make sure they know who you're pointing at. Brandon. There we go. Okay. Now, look right. You two look at me now. Here's what soul winning is, Brandon. Soul winning is when you help somebody come to Christ. You stick with that person until that person has been baptized. You get them in church. And then you train them until they have been able to do for somebody else what you did for them. That's God's plan to win the world. It really works when everybody does it. So would each of you turn and point to one person quickly, very quickly, just anybody, just turn and point to one person. Each of you standing, point to another person, anybody, quickly, just quickly, anybody. Everybody in here is seated. It doesn't make a difference. Everybody you look at is lost. It doesn't make any difference. All right, stand up. Would you stand up when she points to you? Stand up. Who'd you point to, Brandon? Point to me again. Sir. Okay, stand up. All right, now, quickly, who'd you point to, ma'am? Have them stand up. You guys are not helping me at all. Stand up. There you go. Now, each of you standing, point to one person. Stand as they point to you. Everybody quickly, stand and point to one person. All right. Each of you standing, turn and point to one person. Everybody standing, point to another person. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Eternity is in the balance here. All right. Everybody standing, turn and point to one person. All right. Good. Everybody standing, turn and point to one person. All right. Notice how it's kind of around where people are, and that's the way it normally goes. All right. Stand and, everybody stand and point to one person. All right. Don't forget that corner over there. Those people need Christ too. <laughs> All right. All right. Everybody stand and turn and point to one person. All right. Everybody stand and turn and point to one person. All right. Everybody standing. Hey, don't forget the uttermost parts of the earth up, up there. Everybody standing. Point to one person. Everybody standing. Point to one person. Got a group in the middle here that need. Over here need. All right. Everybody standing. Turn and point to one other person. All right. Somebody get this crowd in the middle right here. All right. Great. Now would you all look at me for just a minute if you would. Jesus is coming back at any moment. The rapture could happen today. The first event after the rapture is the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, you don't want to miss tonight, 6 o'clock. Now, Brandon, well done. And how many of you want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, when you get to heaven? You're going to find out how to do that tonight. Well done. Great job. Praise the Lord. Now I'm going to ask you another question. And I'm going to ask you this time to say no. You're not going to want to, but say it good and loud for me if you would. You ready? Brandon, would you be willing to be a soul winner and use your influence to help people come to Christ? No. Mm. And would you be seated? Now watch this, Brandon. Would every one of you who are standing because he said yes a minute ago, please be seated? Brandon, that's how important your life is. The devil will want you to know that. That's how important your life is. Yours? 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 Every one of us in this building. Look right at me. What? Is it going to profit a person if they have everything this world has to offer and never understand the value of their soul or of others? Let's pray. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. How many of you in this building right now would say, Preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. If I die today, I know for sure I'm going to heaven.